Hello, uh, my name is Zhe Yudun, and uh, currently I'm a research fellow from the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Singapore. So today it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be here and uh, uh, present my research to you. And my, my title is Face, Face Behavior in Nazi Cone Electrolyte and Electrode. So as we all know, lithium-ion battery is one of the most widely used and commercialized technique for the mobile electronic devices like laptop and the mobile phone. Uh, however, lithium-ion battery, this technique is not perfect. So there are two reasons. First of all, lithium is not distributed evenly on the earth. So as you can see on the right side for the pie chart, so lithium is mostly distributed in Bolivia and Chile. Uh, so one way to conquer this problem is to replace lithium with sodium. So another issue about lithium-ion battery is, is the safety issue uh, of using the flammable liquid or polymer electrolyte. So famous example is the Samsung Note 7, which was reported previously um, they caught fire. So uh, the method to conquer this problem is to use so-called all-solid-state battery techniques so that we can achieve a safer and longer life cycle and a higher performance device. So one uh, here I show one example on the left side. Uh, it's, a, it's a diagram of a structure of the uh, all-solid-state battery. You can see it's very similar to the traditional uh, lithium-ion battery. You have anode, cathode, and electrolyte inside but they were all solid states. Uh, on the right side is a real example of all solid state battery. So here they use a technique called um, Nasikun materials. So um, that is what I'm here, I'm, uh, what I'm going to do research on. So, um, so what is Nasikun structure? So the full name of Nasikun is called Natrium Superionic Conductor, uh, which has a formula of uh, um, this. And as you can see, it's very complex, it contains sodium, zirconium, silicon, phosphorus, and oxygen. Uh, so it's, it, was construct, it is constructed by this so-called lantern unit. So the lantern unit is, is, com uh, is composed of two uh, zirconium oxide octahedra and the two silicon or phosphorus tetrahedron. And there are six um, sodium sites, uh, th th there are eight sodium sites nearby. The two of them are called sodium one site, which sit uh, between the two um, lantern units, and there are also six uh, sodium two sites uh, sitting around this lantern unit as well. So, um, so, as you can see, the structure is very, very complex. So, the phase behavior knowledge is kind of limited. Although there are some experimental studies before, there are not so many computational studies on this on the phase behavior of these materials. So it's quite challenging for um, for <clears throat> for computational scientists to do the modeling of these materials because of it's very complex. It has disordering. It has lots of composition. Also, it, the structure is very large. So um, so you have lots of atoms inside the structure. So also, because it's a very, uh, it's a superionic conductor, so the energy landscape is very flat. So that brings a lot of challenge for optimization as well. So here we use a multi-scale approach. So we start from the, our crystal structure, then we enumerate all the possible structure at different compositions. And then we pass into a um, so-called density functional theory um, calculation to calculate the total energy. And here, for density functional theory, we use VASP code. And then, by, after we got the total energies, and then we can fit a, a so-called cluster expansion model, which is shown here, um, so, that you can, um, so that you can express the total energy as a function of small clusters. And here, we use CASM code, which is, uh, which is developed by uh, Professor Vandervan from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And then after that, we can get a Hamiltonian. By using this Hamiltonian, we can run Monte Carlo, and then we can get all the phase behavior, also the phase diagram for these materials. 
So first of all, let's look at the comparison uh, between uh, the DFT calculations and experimental uh, structure properties. So the left side is the volume as a function of uh, uh, sodium com composition. So we can see uh, the stars are experimental value from different papers. And uh, um, the, the color of each dot uh, represents the, uh, the energy. So the darker the color, the more stable, the lower the energy the structure is. So when we connect these three uh, most stable structure at 0, 2, and 3, we can see that we kind of reproduce the trend of um, experiment. So basically from 0 to 2, from the low, uh, in the low concentration region, the volume will increase as an increment of um, uh, sodium concentration. And then from 2 to 3, the volume will kind of decrease. So this is a well captured, this experimental feature is well captured by our DFT calculation. And if we look in more detail at for the uh, lattice parameter A and the C, we can see that, for, uh, for example, for lattice parameter A, it's always increasing when we increase the uh, sodium concentration. And uh, for, however, for lattice parameter C, it's first increase and then decrease. So both, uh, both agree very well with experiment. And then we, we can plot all, the, um, all of this formation energy as a function of uh, composition. And we can show as here, this is called a convex hole plot. And then um, each point here, each orange point here is a DFT calculation. So, so here there's 800 DFT calculations. You can, imagine, you, can, you can imagine how complex is this calculation. So, uh, so we also show our uh, fitted model, um, cluster expansion model here. And, um, and we can see that our cluster expansion model produced very well um, with the, uh, for, for, the, for, for, the, uh, for the convex hole. And, and then we can already see the phase separation here. So there's no point on the convex hole between 0 and 2, so, um, which indicates that any composition at 0k, any composition between 0 and 2 will decompose into these two composition. And similar as uh, from 2 to 3, any composition between 2 to 3 will decompose into these two structures. So when we take these two structures and visualize them, we can see that so we can name them as a, a, B, and C for these three phases. So for structure A, you can see that all the sodium stay at the sodium one side, and all the silicon and phosphorus tetrahedron are basically uh, phosphorus. And then when we go uh, to x equal to 2, uh, then we can see that all the sodium are sitting at the sodium 2 side. And as we go higher sodium concentration, then we can see all the sodium sites are fully occupied. So after we have the, that knowledge, then we can run Monte Carlo, uh, and then we can get this type of uh, phase diagram as a function of temperature and uh, composition. So we can see they already uh, have three mon uh, monophasic region, A, B, and C, but also at higher temperature, there's another one called C prime, which is, um, uh, which is um, kind of a disordered phase uh, merged between phase B and phase C. So uh, there are also three biphasic region, uh, A plus B and A plus C prime and B plus C. Uh, however, those region, those phase separation, those phase separation region are not reported experimentally before, and I will explain it later. So let's look in more details for uh, this phase diagram. So if we go through these three temperatures, uh, 445K, 625K, and then 905K, uh, and then we look at the thermodynamic properties here, uh, which is uh, Gibbs free energy and the configuration, configurational entropy plot here. And we can see that the Gibbs, at, uh, at low temperature, the Gibbs free energy, uh, the shape of the Gibbs free energy plot is very similar to the convex hull, which is a triangle shape. Uh, they have a minima in the middle at sodium 2. And also for the uh, configuration entropy, uh, they also have a minima in the middle. 
So basically, when you go uh, go up the temperature, when you increase the temperature, then you can see that uh, the the phase region is getting broader and broader, and also um, the the curve is also getting smoother and smoother. And then another interesting thing is to look at the uh, sodium occupancy uh, at different concentration and temperature as well. So we we took the same uh, temperature and the concentration as before. And here we can also compare with um, compare with experimental value as reported by Bolliot. Uh, so as we can see, uh, at low concentration and low temperature, uh, all the sodium tends to stay at the sodium one side. So we see the sodium the occupation of the sodium one side is one, whereas the sodium at the sodium two side the occupation is zero or almost zero. And then when you increase the sodium concentration, you will increase the uh, the, the occupation of the sodium two sites. And then when you go into the side uh, when you go into the phase B region, then suddenly uh, sodium tends to go to the sodium two side here. And then uh, when you move to the sodium uh, phase C region, the sodium are all occupied. And when you go up, when you increase the temperature, then you kind of make this curve getting smoother and smoother. And as you can see, this feature is well captured. Um, this feature from experiment is well captured from this Monte Carlo simulation, which is very interesting. And then we go back to the, pro uh, the question that I raised before. Why there is no experimental uh, evidence or observation for, this two, for those phase separation region? So, uh, so one, one of the major issues is that this, in this study, we only consider the thermodynamic factor, so we, we never um, explore the kinetic effect. However, uh, if, if you imagine, if you stay in the, uh, in the middle of the phase separation region, then you, you, you might need to phase have phase separation, right? So then you need to redistribute both sodium and also silicon and phosphorus. For sodium, it's quite easy because this is a superionic conductor. So the energy landscape is pretty flat. However, for silicon and phosphorus, they were, they were kind of locked within this uh, tetrahedron. So they have very strong covalent bond between silicon and phosphorus and uh, oxygen. So that it um, they cannot move freely move uh, within the structure, so uh, so this kind of redistribution is might be inhibited kinetically. So uh, so in the end we we didn't see this clearly from experiment, and other frameworks like uh, silicon sulfide and phosphorus sulfide framework might have the similar effect. Um, when we when we go when we expand this type of um, knowledge to other Nazi structure, especially Nazi electrode, um, so some most of them they don't have the silicon here, where they re replace the zirconium with a transition metal uh, here, and um, where and the transition metal they can change the oxidation state, so here. Um, here, um, they don't. They don't. There's no need to redistribute the silicon and phosphorus. So they, what they only need to do is to redis, um, changing. They, they can change the oxidation state for the metal side. So, um, so actually, from ex, from experiments. So here, I show the experimental voltage curve for the uh, where the where the where the transition metal is equal to chromium, vanadium, titanium, and iron. So you can see there are lot. They have a very prominent flat, um, this type of flat um, shape pattern here in the for the voltage curve, uh, which indicates that there is a, a strong phase separation in those region. So we uh, how if we can um, if we can add some so uh, silicon inside uh, of for for those materials. If we dope some silicon, then we might hinder this type of effect. Um, so yeah, basically that's it. Thank you for your listening, and I, in the end, I would like to thank to my uh, to the to my all of my colleagues in the group, and also um, the Green Energy Program and the Singapore France uh, ANR NRF project. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention, and I would like to take some question. Thank you.